Um, thank you for joining us. If you are logged on for the first time, welcome to New Life Church Online. Uh, to all our visitors overseas, welcome. And to all of our members who are with us, um, not together, but scattered and unfortunately um, in your living rooms, thank you for joining us and worshiping with us in spirit this morning. We have been uh, going through the Gospel of Luke and more specifically the, the parables of Jesus over the last few months. And we are getting to the end of this sermon series. In fact, um, this will be our second or third last message as Jesus gets closer and closer to Jerusalem where he will die on the cross for the sins of mankind. But in our passage this morning, Jesus is on his final trip to Jerusalem. He would very soon enter into the city on Palm Sunday. And as we saw last week, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure and spending a lot of time teaching them about the coming of the kingdom and what exactly kingdom life looks like. So here in our passage this morning, Jesus is in Jericho, which is very close to Jerusalem. And he had to pass through the city of Jericho on the way to Jerusalem. And in Luke 18, the passage before, as Jesus draws near to Jericho, he encounters a, a blind man whom he not only healed physically, but he saved spiritually as well. Then in the beginning of Luke chapter 19, Jesus enters Jericho where he meets Zacchaeus and he has a conversation with him and he leads him to faith and um, he stays in his home uh, for a time. So this is where Jesus is at the moment. But there is a lot of excitement. There is a lot of expectation regarding the possibility that Jesus would enter Jerusalem and assume the the kingship. And that's what we will be looking at this morning. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, let me read from verse 11 to verse 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So that's the context. And here's the parable. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slaughter them before me. Well, let's pray before we study God's word together. Heavenly Father, we know, Lord, everything that you have said in your scriptures has been recorded for us for a reason and for a purpose. And even though we may not understand it, and even though it may seem severe and very un-PC, we know, Lord, they are your words. We know they are 
inspired and they are profitable for correction and for training in righteousness. And Lord, we ask that your Spirit would train us tonight, today. We pray that your Spirit would open our eyes to the truths that are here for us to learn about the kingdom and how we can expect your coming and how we are to live in light of that coming and how we are to prepare ourselves for your triumphal entry into the world once again. So we ask, Lord, please teach us. Help us to understand and help us to apply these truths that are here for us this morning. In Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, if you asked me the question, what is the kingdom of God and what does it mean to be kingdom-minded, I probably would have answered something like this. Well, I guess that it's where we all go as Christians when we die. It's probably heaven. The kingdom of God is probably heaven. And I think that a lot of Christians still think that way. We really don't know exactly what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is not heaven. We will look at that today, what exactly the kingdom of God is. If somebody was to ask you that question, how would you answer? What is the kingdom of God? How would you respond? Well, if you go through the Gospels, you will find over and over again this theme of the the kingdom of God. Um, The Beatitudes begin with a promise about inheriting the kingdom of God and draw to a close with the assurance that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Given that it was such importance to Jesus, he preached about it constantly in his ministry. This theme, this topic of the kingdom of God should be important to us as well. When the Bible talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, what is it talking about? And what impact does it have on our lives as we seek to be kingdom-minded? These are important questions that we need to be able to answer. Well, in today's passage, Jesus, just, Jesus again talks about the, the kingdom. He's been doing that all through his parables. But he also addresses some wrong understanding of the kingdom. And so today I'm going to lay a foundation for the parable by showing you what Jesus means by the kingdom before we examine what the parable says. If you look at verse 11, Jesus says there, as he talks to his disciples, it says, as they heard these things, what things did they hear? Well, they were looking, referring to verse 10. Jesus said in verse 10 that his mission was to seek and to save the lost. So as the disciples heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And look there at the last portion of verse 11. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately, they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. That is a very important statement. If you have a pen, underline that in your Bible. I think it's very hard for us to grasp just how, just how pumped up the people around Jesus were regarding the possibility that Jesus would enter into the kingdom and assume the, the kingship. You know, the, the time was the, the Passover, and every Passover time, there was a Jewish expectation regarding the Messiah. It was a very heightened expectation. And Jesus' followers had in mind that Jesus was heading to Jerusalem to assume the the kingship. That he would defeat the Romans and he would usher in the anticipated time of peace and prosperity that they had read about, that they had heard the prophets speak about in the Old Testament. And the people of God had much evidence from the scriptures. The prophets had spoken and predicted the day when when they would again have a king reign from the throne of David. And this king would not only rule the nation of Israel, but he would also rule the world. So Jesus is in Jericho. He's very close to Jerusalem. And the distance between 
Jerusalem and Jericho is 25 kilometers, not very long at all. And this would take about eight hours to walk that distance. So the people are excited with anticipation. And we know Jesus is in Jericho. We know he's staying at the, the house of Zacchaeus. And perhaps while Jesus was staying at the house of Zacchaeus, he could see the winter palace of Archelaus, who had ruled Judah shortly after Jesus had been born. Now this is important for us to understand the context here, because what Jesus says in this parable has much to do with Archelaus. Archelaus was the, the son of Herod, King Herod. This is the same king who had all the children in the vicinity of Bethlehem murdered in hope that Jesus as a toddler would be killed. So in the city of Jericho, where Jesus is telling the parable, Archelaus had built a huge and magnificent palace. So when Herod died, he left his kingdom and his wealth to his three surviving sons. And Archelaus was one of these sons. He was one of those who inherited Judea. Only the, but the thing is, only the Roman emperor could appoint him as a king. Remember, they were still under the governance of the Roman Empire. So Achilles had to travel to Rome in order to be crowned as king. But there was a problem. The Jews, they didn't like Achilles. He was a very cruel um, person, and he abused his authority. And they sent a delegation to the to the Roman emperor, begging the emperor not to make Archelaus king over the, the Jewish people. So the title of king was not confirmed upon him. Instead, he was made the governor of Judea, which really was a demotion, a huge demotion. And you can imagine when Archelaus, he returned, he was very angry. And out of revenge, he he executed, he killed all of those people who had been unfaithful to him. Um, he was very cruel. He was, he was a, a horrid person. And ten years later, Caesar himself banished Archelaus from this region because he was so extremely cruel. So it's this historical background that prompts Jesus to tell the parable of the ten minas, to tell the parable of the, the master who goes and then comes back. And Jesus' parable would have reminded his hearers who were listening to the story, his immediate hearers of the, of the story of Achilles, who is now dead. And he's talking about the kingdom. He's really trying to use the, the kingdom of Achilles to help them understand a bigger picture of the kingdom of God. But the question is why? Why did Jesus, knowing the history of the man who had ruled very cruelly from this city, tell a parable like this? Um, and it refers to himself. It refers to Jesus. Well, verse 11 tells us that he told this parable to make it clear. To make it clear that the time for his ruling over the world was not yet. It wasn't immediate as the people expected. It was not yet for him to come into his kingdom. The closer Jesus got to Jerusalem, the greater the excitement, the greater the anticipation that he was about to set up his physical kingdom on this earth. But the disciples did not understand that Jesus was about to depart from this earth and he was to go to, a, to the far country of heaven where where God the Father would crown him as king of the kingdom of God. So Jesus was comparing, helping him to understand these kingdoms. And I think Jesus was hinting at his imminent departure. He was going to leave them very, very soon, where he would go to the Father in order to receive his kingship. And then he would reign until some future time known only by the Father. And then he would return to earth in glorious triumph. So my first point this morning 
is simply what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? As I said, this is a very important theme for us to understand in the Bible. The ESV translation uses the word kingdom 126 times in the Gospels. the kingdom constantly he said the kingdom of god has come therefore repent and believe he didn't just preach the kingdom of god he preached the coming of the kingdom and the way people could enter it sorry we're having some technical problems here we are right Okay, sorry about that. Look at Acts 28. In Acts 28, verse 31, um, the, Paul summarizes it like this. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This summarizes Paul's ministry. He preached the kingdom of God. The author of Hebrews exalts in the fact that cannot believers in Christ are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. In Second Peter chapter 1, Peter encourages his readers with the thought of being richly welcomed into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then in the book of Revelation, all the hosts of heaven, they erupt in praise. In verse 10, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. But what exactly is the kingdom? I haven't yet quite answered that. I've just shown you how often it's used. And that leads me to my second point. God's redemptive reign. God's redemptive reign. So first, the kingdom of God is God's redemptive rule over his people. The kingdom of God is God's reign. It's his sovereign action in the world to redeem and deliver a people. And then at a, at a future time, finish it and renew his people and the universe completely. And the kingdom of God at the moment is, is a spiritual kingdom. It is not physical. Usually when we think about a kingdom, we think of a particular plot of land with a, a well-defined set of, of borders. And kingdom is usually a, a geographic word for, for most of us. But the kingdom of God at the moment is spiritual. There will be a day when it be, will be physical, but at the moment it is spiritual. And at the moment it is His redemptive rule and reign that He lovingly and sovereignly exercises over His people. And the only way to enter into God's kingdom is not through a physical door, but it is through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And the cross alone is the gateway to the blessings of the kingdom. The cross alone enables us to become citizens of the kingdom. So Jesus came to inaugurate this kingdom. So he came to institute this kingdom kingdom which one day will be established with perfect justice and righteousness and you don't get to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom unless you come through the lord jesus christ through the blood of the king of this kingdom the fact that jesus is going to rule the world with perfect righteousness is unfortunately not good news to everybody if you think about it it's actually terrifying news why because not everybody in the world is righteous not everybody in the world is able to have a passport in order to enter into this kingdom we are born as enemies of this redemptive king this redemptive ruler we are born as enemies and we will be judged because he is perfect in every way and if we get what we deserve, because he is a just judge, we will get his wrath. The wrath that is prepared for us. So the coming physical kingdom is only good news if the coming king is a savior. 
So he's not just the judge who will give us what we deserve. He's not just the executioner who will give out the, the sentence. But he is the Savior as well who forgives sin and makes people righteous. And he does that through the death on the cross of Calvary. If we forget about this fact, this, this amazing fact, then it's not really good news. It's, it's bad news. It's sad news. It's horrible news. It's terrifying news. Because a judgment awaits. You think about the kingdom that we live in here. That's ruled by the authorities that, that govern this kingdom. We have to live by their rules, isn't it? We can't make the rules. This is not a democracy. We don't get to even um, have a say. It is ruled by the authorities who are the, the kings in many ways. If we want to live here, we have to live under their terms and their conditions. But the kingdom that will come is not a democracy. It is ruled by a righteous king. It is ruled by the king of heaven. And the good news of this kingdom is that Jesus has come to save a people from the wrath of God so that we can become citizens of this kingdom. And this is open for all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And the way he did this, the way he opened the door, was by dying in the place of, of all sinners. So Jesus is not just the king. He, he is the suffering king. He is our redeemer king. He is our redeemer ruler. And the only way into the kingdom is through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the third point this morning. So God's kingdom is now, but it is also still to come. So the picture we see in the Gospels as Jesus unfolds the teaching of the kingdom is that it is both present and it is still in the future. In fact, this is what he means when he says that the mystery of the kingdom is here. It is present, but it is without consummation. So let me give you a few examples from the scriptures we see in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. We pray that, isn't it? So even though it is present, it is still to come. There's a future dimension of, of the kingdom right here in the, in the Lord's Prayer. And we should pray that prayer every day. Bring your kingdom, Lord. Bring your perfect kingdom. It's not here the way that we want it to be. There's still sin amongst us. We are still affected. I mean, look at COVID. Look at all the consequences because of disease. This is all because of the curse of sin. So God's kingdom is not perfectly consummated. And we pray, Lord Jesus, come. Bring your kingdom. Bring your reign fully in people's lives, in, the, in my life and in the world. People are still serving sin. And we see the, the world around us. It looks like it's, it's imploding, isn't it? And we see people responding in, in terrible ways and being unkind to each other. And that's because sin is still here. The kingdom of Satan is still here, the dark kingdom. And we pray, Lord, your kingdom come. So the kingdom is at hand. Jesus prays this. He says it. He preaches this. And he, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And here in Luke chapter 19, Jesus tells this parable as he goes to Jerusalem. Because the people thought that the kingdom was coming immediately. Understand that. But Jesus knew that it was not coming immediately. The kingdom of God is not going to appear immediately but yet, over and over again, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. So we pray for the kingdom, but the kingdom of God is at hand. Can you see the tension here? How can the kingdom of God be both? Not yet present, but already present. How is this possible? We are to pray for it. We are to pray for its coming. It's not here. It's not going to be immediate. And yet it is here already. It's present in our midst. It's upon us. 
How can Jesus say all of this? Well, when Christ came to earth, He inaugurated the kingdom. And what I mean by inaugurated is that He, he installed the kingdom. And in Him, the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus makes a, a staggering claim here. He says to the Pharisees, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Look at that past tense. The kingdom of God has come upon you. So in, in here in Matthew 12, Jesus was driving out demons, and he was doing this by the Spirit of God. He was doing this by the Spirit of God. So what Jesus was claiming was that God's promised deliverance of His people had already begun. The Messiah that they had heard the prophets speak about and had been expecting and had been eagerly anticipating had arrived. The kingdom had come. Jesus in the flesh had installed the kingdom. He had inaugurated the kingdom. And as we have gone through this wonderful gospel of Luke, we see Jesus healing the sick. We see prophecies fulfilled about this coming kingdom. We see Jesus making blind people to, to see. And we even see Jesus raising dead people from the grave. All fulfillment of prophecy. Greg Gilbert says in his book, What is the Gospel? He says, Step by step, blow by blow, Jesus was decisively rolling back the effects of the fall. The rightful king had come, and all that stood in way of the establishment of his kingdom, sin, death, hell, Satan, was being decisively overcome. So we see the many blessings of the kingdom had come. And if you're a child of God, those blessings of the kingdom are, are ours. But despite all that, that Jesus did to overthrow the, the powers of evil, He did not fully establish God's rule on this earth. He hasn't done it, but He will do it when He returns. He hasn't done it yet. And Greg Gilbert continues to say in, in, in his book, he says, The strong man was bound, but not destroyed. Evil was defeated, but not annihilated. And the kingdom was inaugurated, but not brought to full and final completion. And we can see that. We can see that clearly amongst us experience your experience my experience tells us that we are living in a world that is still affected by the curse of sin so god's perfect and righteous rule hasn't been fully completed yet because there's unrighteousness still around us we can see that clearly isn't it and jesus spoke of a future day when the kingdom would finally be consummated we talk about consummation in marriage when a husband and wife completely, fully become a husband and wife. And that's the consummation we're talking about of this kingdom, where the kingdom will be fully and finally accomplished, where it will be fully and finally made perfect. And that's when the Lord will return. In Matthew chapter 13, in verse 41 to verse 43, on that day, Jesus says, the Son of Man will send His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. He also looks forward at the Last Supper to the day when when, when he would drink the fruit of the vine again with his disciples. And he says these words in Matthew 26, verse 29. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day. Which day? The day when he comes. The day when he consummates his kingdom. 
when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Every, day, every time we take communion, we have a future expectation of when the Lord will return. And this is what we're looking forward to, the consummation of the kingdom. This is our hope. This is the great hope that we all have as Christians. The thing which we long for and to which we, we look to for, for strength and for encouragement. This is the day when our King, He will part the skies and He will return to establish His glorious kingdom finally and forever. What a wonderful day that will be. No more sin to, to trouble us. No more effects of the curse to keep us in, in misery. No more tears. No more pain. We will have the righteous king once and finally ruling forever the kingdom that he has promised. And that glorious moment is when everything in this world will be set right. When there is perfect justice. And evil will be overthrown forever. And righteousness will be established once and forever. God promises this in Isaiah chapter 65. In verse 17, He says, For I behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. And in that day, the prophet also tells us in Isaiah chapter 11, he says, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a wonderful day to look forward to. What a wonderful day to look forward to. So let me conclude this. Let me, let me bring this together. Okay? Remember the, the disciples in Jesus' day were expecting the kingdom immediately. And Jesus explain to them it's not immediate he tried to explain to them that that he was leaving and he would return like Achilles did he left his kingdom to be crowned by the roman emperor and he would be coming back but they didn't understand this we need to understand this the lord is returning so this foundation has been laid for us before the lord actually talks about the parable and what Jesus goes on to, to say to the disciples and to us this morning is that we should commit ourselves to serve Jesus faithfully until we see Him again, until we wait His return. We'll go more into the parable next week. But that's basically what the parable talks about. We need to use the gifts that God has given to us to advance the kingdom of Jesus, to advance the kingdom of God on this earth, the spiritual kingdom of God. We don't know when He will return to consummate His kingdom. But when He does, this, this grace period will be over. I think one of the main reasons why the Lord has not returned in 2020 years is because there are still people who need to hear the good news of the kingdom. There are still people in their sin. If the Lord was to return... There would be no more time for them to repent. There would be no more opportunity for them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, when the Lord returns, He's not returning on the, the back of a, of a donkey. He's returning on the back of a, of a white horse. And that white horse is, is a symbol of, of judgment. It's a symbol of war. And the Lord's coming to consummate his kingdom his perfect righteous kingdom and justice will be done but this is not good news for those who are outside of his kingdom 
for those who are not made righteous yet by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we have this grace period until the Lord returns. Those who are lost in their sins will be crushed by God's perfect and holy judgment. And the coming kingdom becomes good news only when sinners are told that the coming king, who is perfect and just and righteous, is also the Savior who will pay for their sins. He is the king who is the suffering king, who is willing to forgive and make us righteous. And he does this all through the death of Jesus on the cross. And we need to be faithfully telling others about the hope that we have in our Redeemer King. So church, we have a responsibility to fulfill. Remember in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus institutes his church, he says upon this rock, talking about Peter's confession of faith, he then immediately says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's talking to the church here. The church has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This authority of that kingdom has been given to the church. We have the right to act in Jesus' name. By the king. This is a huge responsibility that we have as a church. This authority hasn't been given to a government. It hasn't been given to a, to a king or a pope or, or any ruler. But it's been given to the church. This, this bunch of, of argumentative, self-centered, struggling for holiness, but, but gloriously forgiven sinners... We have the keys of the, the kingdom of God. And to put it another way, the church acts as a, as a sort of, of embassy for the government of the king. We're an outpost. We're an outpost of the kingdom of God, surrounded by the kingdom of darkness. And just as the, the embassy of, of a nation is, is meant at least to... Um, to, to showcase the life of that nation to the, the surrounding people, so the church is to manifest the life of the kingdom to the world around us. I'm sure many of you have been to an embassy here in, in Abu Dhabi. And when you enter that embassy, you see all the flags of that, of that nation, don't you? And you get to meet people from that nation. And they have maybe some display of that nation. And you feel like a little part of that nation is there, isn't it? Well, that's what the church should be like. The church is the embassy for the government of the king. And while we are here on this earth, amongst the, the darkness, we are to be the light that displays and reflects our glorious king. C.S. Lewis, he once said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were those who thought the most of the next world. Let me, let me repeat that. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were those, were those who thought the most of the next world. So let's apply this quickly before we conclude this morning. Our present world at the moment seems to be in, in pieces, doesn't it? This COVID has destroyed economies. It's destroyed. It has taken the rug out of, out of people's feet. There has, there has been a lot of upset and turmoil in 2020. Um, we've seen fighting. We've seen earthquakes. We've seen all sorts of things happening in our world at the moment. But I was so blessed yesterday at our, at our prayer meeting to hear somebody pray, Lord, please help us not to get distracted by the things of this world. Help us not to think about just the, the temporary things of this world, but help us to fix our eyes on eternity. And that's exactly what we need to be doing as believers. 
You know, the disciples were thinking just temporarily. They were thinking immediately about the kingdom of God. We need to understand that the kingdom of God is, is eternal. And it is coming. And we have to look forward to that. And if we look forward to that, it should, it should change the way that we think. We aren't to put our eyes on the temporary things of this world that are causing us so much struggle and so much pain. Keep our eyes on eternity rather than on the, the temporary world around us. And I think for too long, the church is stuck in this, in this Friday to Friday mentality or, or Sunday to Sunday mentality. We're just surviving from one week to the next. We're just, we're just maintaining ourselves through, through meetings and, and activities and, and, and traditions. And the challenge today is to use God's keys to the kingdom to bring glory and, and honor to His name, not ours. We're not here to build our own kingdoms. We're not here to worry about our, our bank accounts. The Lord has promised that He will take care of us. We need to fix our eyes on the kingdom that is to come. And the keys of the kingdom have been given to us, not just so that we can in, enjoy this material world around us, but so that we can think about God's kingdom, so that we can point people to the kingdom, so that we can show them how they can enter into God's kingdom, so that we can tell them about our wonderful king. We need to make much of God's kingdom, not our kingdom. Our kingdom is built on sand. It is temporary, folks, and it will be destroyed. I think many of us, what this COVID has taught us, is how much we depend on our own little kingdoms. How much time and effort we've, we've put into our kingdoms. And how much time and how much effort have we put into the kingdom of God? Are we focusing on that which is eternal? Please understand that, that being in the church doesn't mean you are, are automatically a citizen of the kingdom. In fact, it's the other way around. Belonging to Christ is what puts you in His kingdom. Do you belong to Christ? I'm not asking you if you go to church. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you take communion. I'm not asking you if, you, if your parents are Christians. I'm asking you this morning if you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And it's I understand that that is sometimes difficult for us to do. All we see are the temporary things of this world. We see the tactile things of this world. We, we touch and we feel and we look and we see the things that are around us. And we think, wow, this is what it's all about. This is not what it's all about, folks. God's kingdom is coming. He will return with justice and righteousness. And He will rule the world with, with perfect justice. And it will be nothing like we've ever imagined. But before He does, are you sure you're ready for His appearing? If the Lord were to return today, would you be confident enough to be standing before the King of this universe? Have you acknowledged Jesus as the living Lord who was put to death for your sins? Will you turn from your sins and acknowledge Him as the rightful owner of your life? And Christians today, let me leave the last challenge with you this morning. Will you live your life in obedience to Him by looking at heaven's perspective? Let's pray this week that the Lord will give us these spiritual goggles that we can that we can wear, that we will not be brought down by the, the things of this world. And I know the things of this world are, are bringing many people down. And we are tired and, and we are troubled and we are anxious. But if you are a citizen of the kingdom, Jesus says to us this morning, do not be anxious about tomorrow. We can look forward to tomorrow because Jesus is coming. He is coming to rule and he is a righteous king. And we can thank God for Jesus this morning. Pray with me. 
Father, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to set our eyes on heaven. Pray, Lord, that you would give us heaven's perspective, that you would stamp eternity on our eyeballs, Lord, that we wouldn't be so short-sighted that all we see are the things around us. Help us to see your spiritual kingdom. And Lord, it is advancing, Lord. Even though we don't see it, there are people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Even through this pandemic, there are people who've been brought to their knees. People have put their, their faith in, in their own mammon who have been brought to their knees because all of that's been taken away. There are people who are looking to the cross. There are people all over the world who are embracing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, we can't see this, but we are so thankful that this is happening. And Lord, you, we know that you bring all, you, you, you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you. And this pandemic and all of the problems that go with it, you are using for a purpose. We need to believe that, Lord, because your kingdom is real. Even though things seem to be falling apart around us, this is your design, Lord. Nothing happens by chance. Help us to put our faith and trust in this wonderful truth, Lord. And help us to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, we pray for your help this week to live in light of eternity. And help us to live with a greater assurance, Lord, that we are citizens of the kingdom. And help us to live with a greater excitement to be telling others around us how they can enter into this kingdom and how they can have this joy and how they can have this peace that passes all understanding. We pray this prayer, Lord, not just for our joy, but we pray this prayer for your glory, that you, the king of this kingdom, would be exalted by your creatures that you would be honored by those who are your citizens. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.